all your Christmas festivities on well. Let's stand and worship the Lord this morning. There is joy in the house of the Lord. You know, um, it's a new year, but um, it's going to be a new year soon. But um, God's mercies are new every morning, and that's something that we can always count on. You know, we're going to get a new year here in a couple of days. Why? 
Holy Father, precious Lord Jesus, oh God, I hope, I hope as we come before you this morning, that our hearts are towards you, Lord, that our minds are towards you, that we are you are the maker of every year. We know that you are the creator of every day, all of our minutes, and we just praise you. That you might fill our days with your purpose and your will. Father, forbid that we get ahead of you. Please guide us. Walk with us. Show us the work that you have for us to do, Lord. And give us the courage to do it. Father, we praise you so much this morning. We thank you. Our heart is filled with gratitude, Lord. For all that you do for us. For the many, many ways that you bless us. Pray that you would, your spirit would come, your spirit would fill this place, that you would move us. Father, that you would touch the weak, the heartbroken, the ill. Those of you, those who do not know you yet, Lord, I pray that you would draw them to you. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I lift up Mark as he brings us your word this morning. I pray that you would give us ears to hear your message this morning. We thank you this morning in Jesus' precious name. Have you noticed this, that from Thanksgiving to Christmas Eve, time goes by very quickly, right? But then from Christmas Day to New Year's Eve, it's the slowest week ever. Is that true? A couple people think that way, I guess. But it sure seems that way. It seems like from Thanksgiving to Christmas, it's very fast. It happens very quickly. And then once Christmas is over, and you have that week between Christmas and New Year's, it tends to go a little slow. But here we are at the end of uh, the year 2023, and um, we're looking forward to a new year, and different people have different feelings about a new year. And I'm actually going to um, read a verse that Zach mentioned this morning during worship. It's a verse that comes from the book of Lamentations, chapter 3. And uh, these words come from the prophet Jeremiah in the Old Testament. But you already heard them before. To through 26 because of the Lord's great love we are not consumed for his compassions never fail they are new every morning great is your faithfulness I say to myself the Lord is my portion therefore I will wait for him the Lord is good to those whose hope is in him to the one who seeks him it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord Jeremiah wrote those words about God's compassion about God's mercy he said, God's mercy is new every morning. Did you realize that when you woke up today? That God's mercy was brand new? That God doesn't want... The real amazing part of this verse is that Jeremiah wrote this while his city of Jerusalem was under siege, under attack. And even in the darkest of times, even on his worst day, Jeremiah looked up at God and said, God, thank you that your mercy and your compassion is new every single day. 
The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. He, thinking about how when we eat the bread and drink the cup, there's new mercy. There's new mercy. The mercy of God will never run out. His forgiveness will never run out. His mercy is new every day. So today we, we meet here to celebrate the great mercy of God. We're going to have a prayer together and then we'll have the bread and the cup. First, let's bow in prayer. <clears throat> Dear Lord God, we thank you that your mercy is new every single day. <coughs> Lord, when we woke up today, there was life and breath and uh, you provided everything for us to live and to enjoy life. Lord, we want to remember that every time we meet together for worship, there's new mercy available. There's mercy available to every person in this world today. So Lord, we thank you for your mercy. And Lord, help us to be like uh, Jeremiah, even though he was going through a very difficult time, an unbearable time. He was still able to look to you and to look to your mercy. God, no matter what happens throughout this coming year, we pray that we would always be thankful for your mercy. We thank you for the mercy that Jesus demonstrated towards us by surrendering himself. And we thank you that we can celebrate that mercy when we eat the bread and drink the cup together. Thank you, Lord, that we can be here. And we thank you, Lord, that your mercy. If you would take the bread and take the cup, and we will have communion together. Bible has a lot to say about giving. This is probably one of the more common verses about giving. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Yes, some of you know that verse. God loves a cheerful giver. And I know that sometimes giving can be a challenge. Finances can make it challenging. Debt income, all those things can make it a challenge. So in order to make giving a little bit cheerful today, I would encourage you to try this. Uh, just reach over and, and trade wallets or purses with your neighbor, <laughs> and then feel free to give generously, because uh, see, look how cheerful we are already, okay? It should feel that way every time you give. There's an old saying, there's an old saying, that God loves a cheerful <clears throat> giver. So we should give cheerfully to the work that God is doing, in our church, through our mission missionaries, thank you for placing your offerings in the offering box. Thank you for all the many ways that you give throughout the year. God appreciates it, and it's a blessing to so many people. So please remember to be cheerful as you give. Let's bow and pray for the offering that we have received. Dear Lord God, we thank you so much that you generously give to us, Lord. You never hold back, and you always give us your best. So Lord, we want to give like you. We want to be generous, open-handed. We want to be giving. And we want to share what we have with other people. Dear Lord God, we uh, thank you that we can be cheerful as we give because every blessing we, re we receive comes from you, Lord. We thank you and we praise you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, tomorrow will be uh, 2024, a new year. This is the time of year when people make New Year's resolutions. And I have discovered that almost every resolution, most resolutions usually include one of these words in there. That's the word more or the word less, right? People say, I'm going to exercise more and eat less. We'd rather do the opposite, right? But some people say that they, they want to exercise more and eat less. Other people say they're going to save more money and spend less money. Some people would like to get more organized. Some people make a goal or a resolution to spend more time with family. Other people make resolutions about that they want to read more or they want to travel more. Maybe even you have a resolution to read the Bible more or to pray more in the year 2024. But basically that's how they work. We want more of something and less of something else. That's the way resolutions work. And a new year gives us a new opportunity to start over. I don't know why we do this, 
with a, a new year beginning. I don't know why we think that way, but that's the way people think. A new year gives us an opportunity to start over. And what we need to remember is that everybody has the opportunity to start over. Everybody who encountered Jesus needed to start over. And we're going to read a story about a man. The man's name is Nicodemus. His story is in John chapter 3. And Jesus is going to invite Nicodemus and offer Nicodemus the opportunity to start over. So whether it's a new year or not, you can always start over with God. So let's read the story of Nicodemus in uh, John chapter 3, starting in verses 1 and 2. It says, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Nicodemus is a Pharisee, and if we were living in the days of Jesus and Nicodemus, we would have admired Nicodemus. We would have really looked up to Nicodemus because he would have been considered basically a spiritual giant. He would have been a great example to other people. We would have admired him and respected him. We would have been in awe as we listened to him pray and as they you know, shared their knowledge of the word of God. And the Pharisees also were very faithful and diligent in fasting and giving 10%. So those were the kinds of guys you would want to imitate. They were spiritual role models for Jewish people. Now, not only is Nicodemus a Pharisee, you can read in verse 1 that he is a member of the Jewish ruling council, which means he is part of the Sanhedrin, which was a, a governing body for the Jewish people. Now, the Sanhedrin only had 70 people. 70 members in it. So, you know, that's considered, you know, the top of the food chain in the Jewish people's minds. So here's Nicodemus. We would consider him one of the top 70 Jewish people in Jerusalem. So he's a real uh, spiritual heavyweight uh, in those days. Now, I know it's football season right now. And, um, you know, we got college bowl games and NFL going on. But I'm more of a baseball guy. And I, I look at Nicodemus like he's at the plate in a baseball game because um, baseball rules are pretty simple, right? Three strikes and what happens? You're out. You're out. You, you knew that, right? <laughs> we still don't know what encroachment means, do we, um, in the NFL? But three strikes and you're out. Well, I want you to see how Nicodemus is going to, he's going to take a few turns at the plate, but I don't think he's going to quite get it. But let's read that together. Let's look at it together. Go back to verse 2, and you'll notice that Nicodemus says a lot of good things about Jesus. Nicodemus says a lot of good things about Jesus in uh, John chapter 3, verse 2. He says that Jesus is a rabbi. He calls him a rabbi. He calls him teacher. He says Jesus came from God. He says, Jesus, you're doing all these signs, performing these signs. And he says, God is with you. So those are five really good things that Nicodemus says about Jesus. The only problem is this, is Jesus is more than a teacher. He is Lord. He's not just a good man doing good things. Jesus has to be more than that in our lives. Jesus has to be more than that in your life. You can say that God is with Jesus, that's true. But Jesus is God and Jesus is Lord. He can't be just a good man. He has to be Lord. Here's what Jesus said in John 13, verse 13. Jesus said, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Jesus is Lord. You can't call him just a teacher. That's an accurate statement to say that Jesus is a teacher, but Jesus is Lord as well. Jesus said, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Calling Jesus good is not enough. Being good is not enough. Came to Jesus at night. Now, anytime the Bible doesn't explain something, we come up with all kinds of theories, right? We could come up with good reasons why Nicodemus came at night because maybe he didn't want to, you know, battle with the crowds. But maybe on a negative uh, standpoint, Maybe he came because he was afraid of what other uh, Pharisees might think. But we just don't know. We don't know. But we do know that he did come to Jesus. But one thing that we do realize as we study the scripture is, when, is that when there's darkness, 
It means somebody needs the light. Nicodemus doesn't realize it, but spiritually he's still in the dark. He doesn't realize how much he needs Jesus. He's there talking to Jesus, but deep down inside he doesn't realize just yet how much he needs Jesus. So Nicodemus believes a lot of good things about Jesus, and he said a lot of good things about Jesus. So I don't want to say he swung and missed. I would say that was more of a foul tip. He, he came close to getting a hit, but he, he just missed just a little bit. So let's see what Jesus says to Nicodemus in response in John. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Now, Jesus is introducing two brand new things to Nicodemus. We might read this and it sounds familiar to us. Again, we use that phrase, hindsight is twenty twenty. We can look at the whole plan of God and the whole, we can see the whole picture laid out in the Bible. But Nicodemus was living this out and experiencing this in real time. But Jesus introduces two new concepts to Nicodemus which might explain why he didn't fully understand. Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, and Jesus talks about being born again. Now, the Jewish people were longing for a kingdom. They were longing for a kingdom like the days of David, when they were the ones in charge, when they were the ones in power. They were thinking about a physical kingdom, but Jesus is not thinking about a physical kingdom. He's not thinking about the Romans or David's kingdom. It's not an earthly kingdom. Jesus says very, clear, very clearly, no one can see the kingdom of God. Jesus is talking about a spiritual kingdom. And Jesus says that the way that we enter the kingdom of God is by being born again. Now he's going to explain that a little bit more in just a moment. So Jesus invites Nicodemus and you and me into the kingdom of God and he invites us to be born again. Did Nicodemus understand this? No, he didn't. Because he says, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Now, I sure hope that Nicodemus' mother wasn't there hearing this. Because I don't think she'd be on board with this sort of idea. You know, Nicodemus, Nicodemus is a grown man, and I don't think mom wants to carry a grown man in her womb. She already went through that once. But again, Nicodemus isn't really understanding what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is not talking about physical things. He's not talking about a physical kingdom. He's not talking about physical birth. He's talking about entering the spiritual kingdom of God. And he's talking about being born again, which is spiritual birth. So Nicodemus has a problem separating the spiritual from the physical. And we struggle with this too in our Christian lives sometimes. Jesus wants him to know, he wants us to know that being born again is not physical, but spiritual. Jesus wants to offer us a good life on earth, but there's more to it than that. Jesus is offering us eternal life, spiritual life, resurrection life. And Jesus tells Nicodemus and all of us that we have the opportunity to start over. We can begin again. We can enter the kingdom of God. We can see the kingdom of God by being born again. Nicodemus didn't understand this. So Jesus will do his best to explain it to him and hopefully to us as well. So let's move down to John chapter 3 verse 5. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Remember, Jesus has introduced two concepts, the kingdom of God and being born again. Jesus says there's a physical birth and a spiritual birth. We've all experienced physical birth, right? We're here. We were born into this world. We were born into this world on a certain day and a certain year, and, um, and we've all experienced that. But there's also a spiritual birth, according to Jesus. Jesus says, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. To, uh, excuse me, the spirit gives birth to spirit. Mommies give birth to babies, and the Holy Spirit gives birth to Christians. That's the way it works. There's physical birth, and there is spiritual birth. Now, the challenge that we have in the world today, and, and you, you hear this and you see this, 
when, when you look for advice from the world, or if you listen to the world's advice, the world will tell you that in order to start over, you need to get in touch with yourself, that you need to believe in yourself, that you need to empower yourself. Jesus wants us to know that the real power doesn't come from within you. The real power comes from him. The power to start over only comes from God. Jesus said in verse 7, You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. Jesus is telling Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you don't get to the kingdom of God because of your resume, because of your heritage, or because of your position. You don't get to the kingdom of God because you're a good guy. The only way to get there is by being born again, by being born of the water and the spirit. Jesus is telling Nicodemus, this is your chance to start over. This is your chance for a second birth. This is your opportunity at a spiritual birth. Now, it's easy for us to make the connection to what Jesus is talking about. Sure sounds like Jesus is talking about baptism, which at that time, John the Baptist was baptizing people in the Jordan River, but it was still fairly new. But again, we can look back and we can see the whole picture. We can see that Jesus is talking about being born again, being born of the water and the spirit. Here's another verse that helps us understand what Jesus is talking about from 1 Peter 3, verse 21. Peter says, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When someone's baptized, when you were baptized, when you make the decision to be baptized, you don't go under the water to give yourself a bath. It's not The goal is not to get clean physically. It's to be cleansed spiritually. Peter says that. It's not the removal of dirt from the body. That's not what it's about. It's about the forgiveness of sins, pledging your conscience toward God, and it saves you by the resurrection of Christ. The reason we baptize people, the reason why people are baptized is because the resurrection of Jesus makes it possible. Jesus died on the cross. We're going to talk about that before we go. Jesus died on the cross. But if Jesus doesn't raise from the dead, we're lost. So that's why Peter says the water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Isn't that what he said earlier? To be born of the water and the spirit? Now, Nicodemus didn't have that verse, but you do. So we're better off. We're a little better <coughs> off than he was. But let's go back to John 3, 9. And this is, uh, re remember in baseball, three strikes, what happens? You're out. You're out. <clears throat> this is the last time Nicodemus is going to speak in uh, John chapter 3, verse 9. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. How do you think he did? I think he struck out. He tried. He's a lot like me when I'm at the plate. Tried hard, but struck out. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. He didn't understand. Verse 10, Jesus said, You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe? if I speak of heavenly things. So Nicodemus didn't understand. And if, if you come across something in the Bible that you don't understand, that's okay. That's all right. We, we all go through that. But if you, don't, if you don't understand, seek understanding, seek faith, seek wisdom, seek out those answers. Jesus says, You're, you are Israel's teacher. You should get this, Nicodemus, but he was struggling to get it. But you'll notice there's a, there's a connection in verse 10. In verse 10, Jesus said that Nicodemus didn't understand. Do you see that in verse 10? Jesus said, Nicodemus, you don't understand. And in verse 11, Jesus said, you don't accept our testimony. 
And then in verse 12, Jesus said, you do not believe. All of those things go hand in hand. You have to understand it to accept it. And in order to believe it, you need to accept the word of God. So understanding and accepting and believing, all of these things go together. And Nicodemus was struggling with all three. And realize that Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus to bring him into the kingdom. He wants to bring him into the kingdom. He doesn't want him to be left out or excluded. Jesus wants Nicodemus to understand. Jesus wants him to accept the testimony. Jesus wants Nicodemus to believe. And the same is true for you. Jesus wants you to understand it and accept who he is and believe in who he is. Now the next part is, to me, the best part of John chapter 3. Verses 13 through 15. Remember, Nicodemus would have known the Old Testament very well. So Jesus says, okay, Nicodemus, I'm going to explain this on your terms. I'm going to use a story from the Old Testament, from the Law of Moses, passages that you would hold very dear. So in John chapter 3, verse 13, Jesus says, No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of God, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. When Jesus uses the phrase, the Son of Man, he's talking about himself. When Jesus says, Son of Man, he's talking about himself. He is the Son of Man. And anytime Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man, he is talking about the great purposes for why he came to earth. And right here he says, the Son of Man must be where the Israelites were grumbling against God, and they were grumbling against Moses. They didn't have food, they didn't have bread, they didn't have water. There's actually a verse in the Old Testament while they're following Moses. They, they said this, literally, they said this. We'd rather go back to being slaves in Egypt. They, they literally said that. I had a gentleman in church who didn't believe me when I said that. But that's true. That's a verse in the Old Testament. Go on Bible Gateway later, search the word cucumber, and it'll take you to that verse in the Old Testament where he said, we'd like to be back in Egypt in slavery with cucumbers. Now, I don't eat cucumbers, but they can't be that good, okay? <laughs> But that's what they wanted. That's what they wanted. Camp, they complained against God. God sent snakes. And when people were bitten by these snakes, they died. And when they were dying, they cried out to God in a different way. Not to complain, but for God to rescue them. For God to save them. 21 verse 8. The Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So you were complaining to God about what you didn't have healed. Here's how they can be rescued. Take a snake and put it on a pole, and when anybody is bitten, they can look at it and live. If you look up to the snake, you'll live. And Jesus says, that's exactly what I've come here to do. I will be lifted up on a cross. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. And Jesus uses this concept elsewhere in the Gospel of John. John chapter 12, verses 32 and 33. Jesus says, And I, when I am lifted up from the... That makes it pretty clear there. Jesus was lifted up on the cross so that we could be saved. And he says, as he's lifted up on the cross, the fact that he has died and been raised from the dead for all humanity, for the sins of all people, his love. The fact that he gave himself for you. Jesus said he must be lifted up. He also said that we must be born again. Which brings us to the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We just celebrated John 3, 16, didn't we? That's Christmas. That's Christmas. Emmanuel. So it makes us wonder, did Nicodemus follow him? Did Nicodemus <coughs> seek out the opportunity to be born again through Jesus Christ? There are some people who say yes. There are some people who say we don't know. But just like any Bible story that we read, it doesn't really matter what they did, what Jesus has asked you to do. Jesus said the Son of Man must be lifted up. And Jesus said you must be born again. 
So if you're looking for a goal for 2024, maybe your goal should be this, that he must be lifted up. And Jesus said, you must be born again. So maybe today's the day for you to be born again. Maybe today's the day for you to respond to the love of God and the grace of God. <clears throat> Jesus was lifted up so that you could be saved. And uh, this is a great song to sing at a time like this when we realize how we need to be saved by God. And sing that as an invitation song. <clears throat> Ministries. Uh, we have several that are leading ministries in the church, and I would like to recognize them today. When I call your name, would you please come up? And we won't call, and we won't ask you to speak or uh, embarrass you in any any way. But I do want uh, the people to see and recognize you, Mark Ada and Mary. Uh, you don't have to stand up. I understand. Hold, hold your applause uh, because I want to go through uh, all of these names and I want to do that quickly. Mark, that's for you and Mary. And say up here, Mark, would you please join, join the other group. 
uh, Zach Tremblay and Carissa. All right. Carissa's probably in the nursery at Children's Church. He is very new to the staff, our latest addition to the staff, our youth minister. Uh, Nan, uh, John and Nancy Sims, and I know, John, you're busy. Uh, Nancy, can I give this to you? Those that are uh, working with the praise team, uh, Marissa Gata has been in the past this year. Uh, hey, I'll give me that to you. I'll get it. Yeah, <laughs> Dylan, Dylan Humphreys on the drums. Dylan, you can come get that. And Tony and Darnie Petro are in the back. Come up, please. It's right here. That's it. We have people who are heading up ministries. One is uh, the grounds, uh, which we try to keep in shape. I see that we've had another mishap. Uh, Mike Humphreys. Is Mike in the audience? He's not yet. Next time. And uh, uh, the building manager is now uh, Rich Williams. And is Rich here this morning? I think he's in second service. And uh, working in the office, uh, uh, printing the bulletin every uh, week is Joe Lobinger. Uh, we have those that are working uh, in multiple ways, uh, Frank and Linda Whitener, and I think they're not here in first service. Um, uh, they they help with the Feed the Hungry, and uh, Linda is head of our benevolence is the word I'm hunting for. And Cammie Brooks, she's the head of our missions team, and I think she's in second service as well. I'd like to recognize uh, all of you because I know in uh, the church services throughout the year, many of you have helped in uh, feeding the hungry, bringing clothes or food. Uh, uh, we've done that uh, through the year, uh, helping people out. And uh, I know you've had a part in that. There are many activities. Uh, youth will have more activities now. That, uh, Tyson is working with them, and uh, he's looking for volunteers that would help with the youth activities. Hope that you would volunteer for that, and maybe you have already. And we want to Gloria, and it means this, to God be the glory. We're recognizing these folks for what they have done for the Lord. Not to give them glory, but to say, thank you so much for your dedication. Thank you for serving God. And I know many of you uh, working in, with the prayer teams, uh, the small groups, have been involved in the church. Uh, and it, that's part of our outreach. And we want to expand in those areas. And if you have a desire to be a volunteer, um, see one of the elders of Mark. You can talk to him uh, about it. Um, we would love to, to have you involved in, in any area where you feel uh, comfortable serving, where, where God is calling you to serve. Uh, that, that's all I've got to do. Yes, and I will pray. Yes. And thank you all. We do appreciate it. Father, we thank you for the love that you've shown us. Thank you, Father, for giving us an opportunity to serve you in your kingdom's work. We pray that you'll continue to bless our church, and the staff, and those volunteers that are serving. We ask that you would help us to reach out, not only to this community, but to the world at large, that they all might come to know to you goes all the glory, to you the honor, to you, we give you thanks. And for your son, Jesus Christ, it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.